Welcome to the Moses Organic Farming Podcast. This is Chuck from Moses. Our guest today is Naima Peniman, the Program Director at Soul Fire Farm in upstate New York. Naima shares about Soul Fire's model to provide fresh produce to low-income people of color in their community. Their efforts include their solidarity shares that provide culturally appropriate food from their farm to low-income people of color in nearby cities, as well as their education and policy work. Let's get to it. Greetings, my name is Naima Peniman, and I'm honored to serve as program director here at Soul Fire Farm. We're in Muncie Mohican, or Stockbridge Muncie Mohican territory in upstate New York. Um, 80 acres of land and in my role I help to coordinate our Afro-Indigenous training programs helping to scale up a returning generation of black and brown and indigenous farmers and land stewards and we do um, week-long deep dive farmer immersion trainings in addition to building immersions and um, skill shares and specific farming and homesteading practices, everything from growing mushrooms to keeping bees to saving seeds and more. And we also do a lot of programming with youth, as well as doing programming in the neighboring cities of Albany and Troy, helping to support folks in establishing raised bed gardens. Um, and we additionally do a lot of uprooting racism training and um, public speaking and facilitation to support food sovereignty, and racial justice in the food movement. So why don't we start by kind of defining the problem? Can you talk a bit about food apartheid and what that means and, you know, why that term is different than like food deserts? Yeah, well, food desert implies a natural phenomena, right? Deserts are part of our ecosystem where as food apartheid is a man-made system of segregation where some communities are experiencing food opulence and others are experiencing food scarcity. And we see an incredible disparity of what opportunities for accessing fresh, life-giving, nutritious food are, depending on our zip code, where we were born, the communities that we belong to. And it's really baked into every level of our food system from production to consumption. And so as we're thinking about healing a broken system, we need to be thinking of all those phases. You know, food apartheid is the result of, you know, the availability of farmers markets and grocery stores with options or the lack thereof, you know, in our schools. But it, we can trace it all the way back to, you know, how our food gets grown, who's growing it, um, and looking at the labor conditions also in the production. Um, I think it's also part of that same system that we have to look look from from seed to plate at these inequities. So one of the solutions that Soulfire is working on is like the concept of Ujama or cooperative economics. Um, mm-hmm. Do you want to describe that idea a little bit? So we use the principle of, of Ujama cooperative economics around how we distribute the food we grow here at Soulfire Farm, and. We have what we call a solidarity share program to really ensure that our harvest makes it to the tables of those in our community who need it most. And we've operated with a sliding scale model for our community supported agriculture program where folks can, at the top of the season, invest in shares of the harvest. And some people pay above market and some people pay below and we're able to make ends meet on our side while sharing this fresh and abundant harvest um, with folks who otherwise wouldn't be able to access it. And um, in this moment now, while we're in the midst of the COVID pandemic, we've increased that effort even more. Like there are 50 families that currently receive a weekly share of our vegetables, fruits, herbs, eggs, and value add products at no cost. Um, and we do that through direct yeah. doorstep delivery and also through a couple community partnerships, including a refugee center in Albany and another community-based organization that supports folks impacted by mass incarceration. 
and we receive so much feedback and appreciation from from the folks who are receiving this that like this is this is the only fresh food that that we're getting like to be able to you know feed our families and yeah it just means so much to know that we can help to bridge some of those gaps that unfortunately exist in way too many parts of um, our nation. Yeah, so the sliding scale kind of helps to address the one barrier just of cost of, of vegetables and fresh food in general. But can you describe the barriers that led Soul Fire to do home deliveries? Absolutely. So transportation is a barrier for some of the families that, that we serve. Um, being able to pick up food from a certain location. We do have some, like some drop-off locations for folks who are able to, um, but we have a delivery route that goes from our farm through neighborhoods in Troy and Albany and back to the farm every Thursday in order to make sure that the transportation barrier doesn't get in the way. And, you know, accessibility of our produce to low-income neighborhoods is really essential. And we found that this model of doorstep to delivery supports more than if we were to, you know, spend the same amount of hours we do making this delivery route, sitting at, you know, a farm stand or at a farmer's market that instead creating a deep relationship with the number of families that we can serve with our harvest and making sure that that's that commitment lasts through the year. Um, and it's a two-way commitment, right? Because we're also not, you know, waiting for a customer to come buy our produce. It's like, no, we we have decided at the top of the year that these 50 families are who will receive the food that we're intentionally growing for them. So it also ends up being time efficient on our part to not have a, you know, a questionable or transient market. It's like we've 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 made a commitment for the season, and we and we honor that by bringing the harvest directly to those people we've made that commitment to. Could you describe the importance of culturally important crops? Like, say, <laughs> not not trying to, to teach people what kale is, but growing something that, that they already have kind of food culture around? Yeah. So the majority of the members of our Ujamaa program are folks of color, including African-American, Asian, Trinidadian, Nepali, Persian, Burmese, Latinx, Jamaican people, and we do our best to grow culturally relevant vegetables that are requested by our members. Um, we gather data and feedback on what vegetables and crops people desire through surveys and in-person interviews. And it's very important that as much as we can in our cold climate here in Grafton, New York, that we're able to you know, provide um, the food that our, our people resonate with and they, they want to grow. So That includes things like okra and hot peppers, black-eyed peas, um, daikon radish and Japanese sweet potato and napa cabbage and ahi dulce pepper and tomatillos and and sorrel and um, more and more vegetables that we've been really excited to to grow here in our our diversified intercropped farm that, you know, just just bring joy and, and connection and also tell the stories of our of our diverse lineages here in our community. Yeah, that's amazing. That must be such a, a diverse, diverse field. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it sure is. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, was it a was it a steep learning curve to figure out how to grow all those different things, or you know, is it more just like variety selection? Because you know, it's like growing different peppers for that are more culturally appropriate for different people, but it's still growing peppers. Some have been more challenging than others, like particularly because um, we're in a pretty cold zone here and high elevation in a mountainous region. So, you know, to grow sweet potatoes, um, you know, we have to do that in our high tunnel and do some solarization of the soil with black biodegradable tarping and, um, you know, there's been certainly some troubleshooting and innovation with certain hot weather loving crops. I've been really grateful to our former farm manager, Louisa Jacobson, who's still on the team as a co-director and partnerships director, who's introduced a lot of really incredible Afro- Afro-Indigenous crops to our rotations here. And we've been really learning together. And that's been exciting, too, for those who come for our programs to also learn about 
you know, crops that don't always appear on on American farmlands. I'm like, oh yeah, no, we can grow this too. And um, yeah, I feel like our food stories and our connections to certain flavors and smells and ingredients is really, is really powerful and just brings deeper connection also to um, our relationship to the land. Yeah. It's, (laughs) I used to work with tropical fruit. I used to live in Florida and you know, it, the, the connection of food to culture is so important. Like if you ever bring up a uh, Julie mango variety to a Jamaican person, like I've, I've had the most like overjoyed reactions <laughs> or like specific <laughs> yeah. fruits for, you know, like, a like if you bring up Chiku to a Indian person or something, it's just like the cultural importance of those foods even down to the variety where, you know, in a Western capitalist food system, you never know about the variety. And until, (laughs) you know, until you're, until you start thinking how terrible red delicious is, you know, (laughs) right. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Can you go into a little more detail about the process of figuring out what culturally important foods to grow? We did some live one-on-one interviews and conversations as well as had an online survey to gather data and find out what crops people are most excited about receiving and cooking up for themselves and their families Um, and with some of our shareholders it's been an ongoing multi-year relationship that we deepen into and so there's an exciting interchange of communication we have like once a year we have listening sessions with our shareholders, like we do like a end of season harvest meal and it's a chance for feedback and celebration. And we gather some more design thinking approaches from that event as well. In addition to like the surveys that we send out. Yeah, we work, we would just really work to cultivate deeper connections. And we also, you know, every time we, we send out a share, we are also sending out recipes. Um, and sometimes our members will share recipes too that they want other shareholders to receive. So there's there's a circulation of, of information and um, that happens, which is really beautiful. So a lot of it's built on, on relationships with folks in the neighborhoods you work in. And is it also a lot with organizations too, or is it mostly just with individuals? Both. So currently every week our food reaches over 50 families through this program and 25 of the families receive their shares directly through doorstep delivery. And then the other half are through organizational partnerships. Focus Church has distribution. And so some families pick up directly from the church. We also give a drop off at West Hill Refugee Welcome Center. So many families will receive their harvest by picking up there. And then we also distribute food through the Victory Bus Project, which is part of the Freedom Food Alliance. And they ensure that our food is getting to families impacted by incarceration. And in in cases of some correctional institutions, they're able to bring produce directly inside the facility for those who are currently incarcerated. Oh, wow. How did you get started building those relationships with those different partners? I can speak to the Freedom Food Alliance. I guess Soulfire has been part of this network that includes farmers and families impacted by incarceration and organizers who call themselves weavers who are helping to bridge the gaps between like urban and rural communities here in our region in New York. So that's been an an ongoing relationship that Soul Fire Farm has played a part in, both by providing food. We're very close collaborators with Jalal Sabor, who who started the project. He's on our board and is an alumni of our program. And that's that's kind of organically developed over time. We've, We've done also some diversion programs here, like Alternatives to Incarceration for Young People that's been connected to that alliance work as well. And with Focus Church, they reached out with interest in our Soul Fire in the City program, which is our effort to support both families, individuals, and organizations in establishing raised bed gardens in the city so that they can grow some of their own food and medicine in place. And they have a pantry there and they were excited about also having a raised bed garden to be able to supplement what they were growing. And so we were able to provide for them like the labor and the materials and the garden plan and the seeds and starts 
to start a garden for them. And because we end up having even more harvest than we expected this year, since we're not doing on-farm programming and aren't needing to feed the hundreds and hundreds of people that typically would be here in the summer, um, we said, would you also like to receive some of our harvest? And they said, yes, absolutely. So that's how, that's how that connection formed. And that's newer. The West Hill Refugee Welcome Center, I can't speak to so directly because Leah, my sister, has developed that partnership over time and I haven't been close to it. But I know that's been a really critical and important focus of our, you know, just of our intention of what we want to do to our harvest. We have a lot of, you know, new Americans and refugees in our community who are living in food apartheid neighborhoods. And we, we made a commitment early on in the establishing of this farm that we wanted to make sure to include this community in like in the embrace of who Soul Fire intends to be in partnership with and serve. So outside of the the CSA model, what other models uh, do you work with to get produce out to folks? So the Ujama Farm Share is is our primary distribution model. We don't um, do any farmers markets. Um, we do have a partnership with a Black-owned restaurant that buys some of our collard greens and other specific crops. But our doorstep delivery and our community partnerships are the most central. With some of our value-add products, as well as our chickens, um, our meat chickens, there are some opportunities for people to buy directly, even if they're not like subscribers or shareholders. So we've been you know, doing like herb salts and salves and jams and soap and bath salts, um, pestos, things like that, that people are able to purchase through our online store. And we also give some of that away to through, through some other organizational partnerships. And with our chickens, like people always we, we have more demand than, we, than than our chicken meat people really love. So people are always asking, when's the next time you're processing chickens? And we'll like send out an announcement really quick. Now for a quick break to hear about our sponsor, Gemplers, before we get back to the show. Our show is sponsored by Gemplers, a family-owned online farm and home store, providing farmers with commercial-grade tools, equipment, and supplies for the toughest outdoor tasks. Save 20% on Gempler's brand products. Use promo code SAVE20GEMP, S-A-V-E 20 G-E-M-P, all caps. Offer expires 8-18-2020. Exclusions apply. Shop Gempler's.com slash organic for commercial grade products for your organic farm. Do you want to describe some of the education work that you have been working on too? Sure. So in addition to distributing our life-giving and culturally relevant food, we're also a training farm. And in a typical year, we'll welcome over 1,800 people to the land throughout the course of the year for our skill shares and farmer trainings and immersions and uprooting racism trainings, um, as well as workshops for urban youth were able to come here for free to to learn with us. And in this pandemic moment, while we've made a decision for the health of our community to cancel all on-farm programming, we've been very busy with online offerings and Skillshares. Um, we have bilingual webinars called the 3D Virtual Skillshares that are for deepening skills and specific farming and homesteading practices. And we invite guest facilitators of Black, Indigenous, POC descent to, you know, offer these trainings. And they're all interpreted in Spanish and in English. We also have a weekly show called Ask a Sister Farmer, which is a series where my sister Leah hosts another Black woman farmer. And they answer calling questions about urban gardening and agroforestry and plant medicine and food preservation. We also this year launched a video series called Liberation on Land. And this is a really has been a really exciting opportunity for us to invite others in our in our community and network to help to offer like training how to video tutorials that demonstrate practical hands-on skills for making life and livelihood on land that really pay homage to legacies of African diasporic and indigenous wisdom. And we've already released four out of the series of at least 20 videos 
everything from like soil health to mushroom cultivation to how to care for fruit trees to intercropping like so many skills so that's been exciting as well and then we have a training called uprooting racism in the food system which we offer for farming and food justice leaders to really talk about and uproot and create action plans around undoing systemic racism both in their organizations and in the larger society we used to do that in person, but we now we're doing this online as well. Those are some examples. And in addition to those training opportunities, we also are working to provide a lot of resources and support and mutual aid for BIPOC farmers and, and navigating the pandemic and beyond, right? So we were hosting bi-weekly calls for Black, Indigenous, and people of color farmers for mutual aid around the pandemic. And through that, created a whole thing food and land sovereignty resource list with hundreds of resources um, to support folks in this challenging time who are already deeply engaged in the food system and farming. And then additionally, there's a lot of people who who haven't farmed or grown their own food before who are very interested and catalyzed by this this moment where, you know, the inequities and flaws in our food system are laid bare and folks are really thinking about how do we have more agency over what we eat and wanting to grow some of their own food, wanting to support their communities in growing food. And so we've really galvanized a lot of effort towards helping to provide resources. So the Ask the Sister Farmer series and the Liberation on Land Skillshare video series and other things I mentioned are opportunities for that. And we've also, you know, compiled lists of resources in our curriculum and are sharing that widely. And it's been really inspiring and important to to see this increased focus you know, of course, food insecurity existed before the pandemic and it will exist after. But I feel like this is a really important galvanizing moment for us to be prioritizing and really centering the importance of us engaging on, on all levels and helping to heal our food system. Yeah, I feel like people are, are thinking about it in a new way. Like where, where I live, there's a lot of meatpacking plants. I, I live in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. and um, And people are thinking about the workers in those, maybe for the first time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and what what kind of conditions they work under and uh, you know, how they're treated by the corporations that that run those plants. And and then, you know, it all comes back to, you know, in March looking at the empty supermarket shelves where you couldn't buy chicken. So yeah, it's it it seems yeah. like an opportunity. Like out of all the darkness from it, some light can come out that's people being aware that kind of the entire food system is built on oppression. Yeah. I agree with you, right? It's like become very clear that farm work is essential work in the light of COVID where we have this distinction that the government has really designated, you know, essential work and yet how ironic that farm workers are excluded from many protections under the National Labor Relations Act and Fair Labor Standards Act, you know, denied the right to collectively bargain or have overtime limits or child labor restrictions. and Or even minimum wage. Yes, even minimum wage. Yeah. And so I feel like that's really come to light. I mean, the vast majority of our food, over three quarters of the hands that pull our food from the earth are foreign born, born across these so-called borders, Spanish speaking and subject to a myriad of oppressions of our immigration system. And we need full protection for farm workers under the laws, as well as pathways for farm workers to become decision makers and owners on the land where they, where they toil. I also feel that this time is really stressing, you know, principles of collective work and mutual aid. And in West African traditional societies, we have an institution called Dokpue or Kombi, which refers to that, like coming together to plant one another's crops or support in building other people's homes, share provisions, you know, really like collective care of our commons. And I I think that principle is in a lot of our lineages, but we've abandoned that sense of, of real, like, yeah, collective work. But in this moment as conventional systems for meeting our basic needs are strained, we see this blooming of mutual aid pods and otherwise emulations of our indigenous ways of caring for all members of society um, that I think can serve us well beyond this moment of crisis. I hope it like shifts a fundamental pattern in how we relate to each other and relate to our, you know, our shared resources and, and our shared needs. Yeah. It's, you know, just seeing our national response or 
lack thereof to the pandemic is like, you know, it's a collective problem that there's a bunch of radical individualists trying to solve it. <laughs> and it's, uh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's kind of laying bare a lot of the, um, the folly of a culture based on capitalist consumption, basically. Mm-hmm. So, you know, even in, like in my family is from Sweden and there's a word in Swedish called logom. That's basically, it comes from the story that I've been told anyways. Like it comes from Vikings when they would, they would drink beer from the same cup and pass it around. Mm. And when everyone got about the right amount and it came all the way around and everyone got their share, that was logom. Mm. And so they use that to describe like, you know, if there's a conversation and it's shared equally, like no one's dominating it, but it's like you're listening and, and people are equally contributing and their ideas are heard. That's logom or, you know, it's just this idea of, of like everyone having enough and that being like a good and a value <laughs> in and of itself that like, yes. you know, like my, my relatives in Sweden think that way. But then when we when we came here, it's sort of like this cultural indoctrination of like, I'm going to get what I need and I don't what you need doesn't factor into that. And yeah. <laughs> it feels like this, this this is a moment that's like hopefully going to teach us eventually that that is a really limited way of viewing the world. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. What other lessons have you learned from the pandemic? I feel like this is a moment of reckoning for our species, the message that, you know, humans have forgotten our humble place in the, in the planet, imagining ourselves to be, to be very central and, and supreme and a time of, of really remembering the importance of ecological humility as being essential for the survival of our species. And in the realm of agriculture, where Industrial agriculture is the number one driver of climate change and responsible for so many ga- greenhouse gas emissions and water pollution and degradation of topsoil and so many other environmental harms, yet can be one of the most regenerative and symbiotic relationships that we can have with the land that it's also a very important moment for us to be reclaiming and practicing um, what are really rooted in our indigenous and, and African farming practices. So we've been with even even more conviction, like just proud to be practicing agroforestry and wild crafting and polyculture and silvopasture here at Soulfire and also being able to share and teach these ancestral farming practices that are able to increase topsoil depth and sequester soil carbon and increase biodiversity. We use a lot of cover crops here you know, just as Dr. George Washington Carver encouraged us to do to prevent soil from eroding and um, nutrients leaving the soil. We produce much of our fertility on site as possible by composting manure from our livestock and crop rotations rather than tilling the soil. Um, We use heavy mulches to smother weeds and encourage worms to do that aeration work and do very minimal tilling, you know, raised beds, just as the Ovambo people um, have mounded their soil for centuries to control water flow. We grow all of our crops in raised beds. And yeah, just a very diversified system of, of growing. You know, fruit trees interspersed among our our plant medicine, like our milpa that we learned from the Mohican farmers who are the original stewards of this land where Soulfire is on, integrating our corn, beans, squash, sunflowers. And this year is the first year um, we've had ruminants. We just welcomed sheep to the land and are working to integrate the pasture for livestock with with trees like sugar maples and chestnuts um, to provide you know shade and break for the animals. And then they're also providing fer- fertilization for our soil. So yeah, we're very excited to just be in the in the practice of these methods. And as we're learning more from our communities, also sharing that out and really being um, a very vital hub of like making sure that we we know ways to be farming in right relationship with the earth and that also we're in touch with the roots of these traditions. And I want to uplift my sister Leah Penniman's book, Farming While Black, that mentions a lot of these practices and strategies and the roots that they come from so that we don't get to thinking that we're part of 
you know, some detached new wave movement of regenerative organic agriculture that's come out of a vacuum, but rather that, that these are practices that are in our Afro-Indigenous lineages that, yeah, that we want to honor and build from as we move forward and create a world where we can all have enough to eat and do it in a way that honors the sacred planet that we belong to, that doesn't belong to us. So I've seen stats recently of you know something like 98% of farmland is controlled by white farmers. And you know, the percentage of black owned farms since 1900 has just plummeted due to violence against black farmers in the South, but also just being denied loans from the FSA and all kinds of other systemic racism that has driven people off the land and into cities in the North. So do you want to talk a bit about the role that land access plays in all this and and maybe some ideas for, for how we can start tipping the balance of these land access issues in favor of a broader range of folks. Absolutely. So Ralph Page of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives put it simply, quote, land is the only real wealth in this country. And if we don't own any, we'll be out of the picture. Right. And so what we've experienced of this intense plummeting of the land that is held by non-Europeans, literally less than 2%, which is the lowest it's been in the history of this country. So it's not getting better, let's be clear, you know, and that's a direct result of land grabbing and expulsion, USDA discrimination, colonial genocide, that the vast majority of farm in this country is owned by descendants of European colonizers, right? And so it's a it's a huge area where we need engagement for reparations for stolen land and stolen wealth to be redistributed to those whose land and wealth were stolen from them, like directly, like um, Indigenous people, African-American people, Latinx. So um, in our policy platform, we recommend, you know, one, a commission to study reparations and propose a comprehensive redistribution of wealth and land. And that's half proposed through H.R. 40. We also need to enforce a moratorium on government foreclosures of Black land and halting seizures of land through USDA and um, Medicaid liens. And we need to support, like through resources and funding, BIPOC-led land trusts that can absorb Black farmland that we're still losing and transfer it within the Black community. We also recommend creating and implementing farmer debt forgiveness programs in cases of discrimination, which, you know, we've we've seen incredible civil rights offenses by the USDA that still need to be addressed. So the USDA should refinance loans for Black farmers who were denied aid. And then we also need to expand funding for the Indian Tribal Land Acquisition Loan Program and the Highly Fractionated Indian Land Program and reverse the policy that victims of mass incarceration are ineligible for USDA programs our citizens who are returning from our prisons and and jails need and deserve support for their farms as well. We also, in the meantime, while we're waiting for the government to get it together around HR 40 and, and a nationwide reparations policy are also supporting voluntary reparations through helping to connect folks who have inherited you know, stolen wealth or stolen property in giving that back to communities who have been disenfranchised from it. Um, So we have the reparations map for Black and Indigenous farmers that um, is an opportunity for folks to individually offer gifts of of land or resources. And there is also a national effort for reparations being coordinated by the National Black Food and Justice Alliance that is also complement to what we're working here with the with Soul Fire and with the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust. Yeah, I I think ab- about land. It's I think it's an underestimated thing just how much wealth it takes to to farm at any scale. Yeah. And you know, people talk about land rich, cash poor farmers or whatever. And I've been learning a lot from Chris Newman at Sylvan Aqua Farms just from his 
his writing and his Instagram posts and things like that. And um, yeah, just how much the land rich cash poor thing, it sweeps the land rich part under the rug real fast to get to the cash poor thing Um, (laughs) where it's just like, you know, the amount of the amount of generational wealth it takes to to enter agriculture is pretty astounding. It, it's a really self-serving narrative, I guess, is is what I've been learning a lot lately. Yeah, because so much of the way that wealth builds is through inheritance, right? That's that's most of it. It's um, the amount of wealth that is passed down through land and property that accumulates in certain families and certain communities is immense and has so much to do with why from the moment a child takes its first breath, you know, a white child is 16 times more wealthy than a black child, fresh out the womb, you know, and that's because of that inherited wealth. You know, if we're looking at a scenario where European descent folks own 98% of the land, that paints a very clear picture of like what's possible when we're talking about wealth building generationally and certainly our ability to have agents in the food system having dignified roles on farms knowing that land is just the first step, not even, you know, the capital that it takes to be able to maintain and manage successful farming operations. So it's, de- it's definitely an area where we need cross-class intervention to be able to, to share in the stewardship of lands here in this country. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. I've learned a lot and continue to learn a lot from the whole team at Soul Fire and everything you guys are doing there. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm honored to talk to you today and um, yeah, really grateful for the opportunity to center these stories. Thank you so much. Thanks again to Naima Peniman from Soul Fire Farm. Naima provided several links to resources for you to learn more about some of the topics we discussed today. So please check those out in the show notes. As part of our new grower group program, some Midwest farmers are interested in starting a group to take action in the fight against racism. If you are interested in helping launch this group, please email me at chuck at mosesorganic.org. Also, due to COVID-19, the 2021 Moses Conference will be a virtual event next February. One thing I'm really excited for this year will be speed presentations from our farmer community. These four-minute videos can cover anything from an insightful tip you've developed through trial and error to a virtual tour of your farm. These four-minute videos can cover anything from an insightful tip you've developed through trial and error to a virtual tour of your farm. So, to be part of Moses 2021, start taking videos and pictures on your farm. See details at mosesorganic.org conference. And thanks for listening to the Moses Organic Farming Podcast. Moses educates farmers in sustainable and organic agriculture. Call the Organic Answer Line to ask a specialist about organic farming and certification at 888-90-MOSES or visit mosesorganic.org slash ask. If you have any questions about today's episode or have ideas for future episodes, please contact me at chuck at mosesorganic.org. Our theme song is Summerfields by the Tenements. If you have a minute, please rate and review our show in your podcast app. It helps people find the show. Thanks again for listening. Law Gom. Thanks, Dad. Happy birthday. Thank you.